Baruch Spinoza was a Sephardic Jew born in Amsterdam to Portuguese parents on November 24th of 1632. Following shortly after René Descartes in the continental rationalist tradition of philosophy, Spinoza's philosophical framework diverged significantly from that of his predecessor in that not only did he reject the idea of mind-body dualism that was so central to much of Descartes' view of the human experience, but he also renounced the idea of a personal God that took any sort of interest in the affairs of his creations or that could be moved to act by prayer or petition. Instead, Spinoza's view of God is what many philosophers refer to as classical pantheism, wherein God and reality are one and the same, similar in many ways to the Logos of the Stoics. Like them, he embraced an Epicurean materialism that held that all matter was made of atoms moving through a void subject only to the laws of nature and any physical interactions with other atoms nearby. In this way, he rejected Descartes' mind as anything separate from the body, suggesting that such a thing, if it existed, arose from the actions of the atoms that made up the body and nothing else. As such, he also rejected free will in all its forms, espousing determinism as an explanation for all human actions and interactions. In addition to this, he claimed that there was only one reality made of one substance governed by one set of rules, prefiguring and in many ways Newton's universality put forth a half a century later. Spinoza thus envisioned a God that did not and does not rule over the universe by providence or personal interaction, wherein he makes changes outside of that change which arises from natural law. Instead, in his picture, God was and is itself the deterministic system consisting of everything in nature. Spinoza argued that, quote, things could not have been produced by God in any other way or in any other order than is the case, end quote. One of the results of this position was that he directly challenged what is commonly known as a transcendental God, or a God outside of the physical creation, that actively responded to events within that physical creation, a common and essential tenet of all Abrahamic faiths. In Spinoza's views, everything that has happened or that will happen is part of a long chain of cause and effect which, at a metaphysical level, is in fact God, and which humans are completely unable to change. In other words, no amount of prayer or ritual will sway God because God cannot ontologically be changed from the deterministic course set out by the motions and interactions of that which makes up reality. Therefore, according to Spinoza, only knowledge of God or the physical existence in which humans find themselves will allow them to best respond to the world around them. While these positions would only be most fully expressed in his work titled Ethics, which was published in the year after his death in 1677 at the age of 44, and was called by one of his opponents a book forged in hell, it is known through his extensive correspondence with some of the greatest thinkers of his age that he held those views for nearly all of his adult life. As such, the Sephardic con congregation in Amsterdam would issue a writ of cherim, or expulsion, on July 25th of 1656. While such writs were not uncommon during this time, as they could be given for transgressions of greater and lesser import, the language found in the one issued to Spinoza was especially strong, leading to his abandoning much of the practice of his, of his faith for the remainder of his life. What is interesting is that while Spinoza renounced his faith, he did not abandon his Jewish identity. During this time period, and for some time afterwards, it was common for those who left Judaism to enter into another faith, either Christianity or Islam, depending on the location of the person's habitation or their general theological beliefs. Spinoza, however, chose not to take this path. And so, even as he lived and worked with groups of Christians, most notably the Collegians and Quakers, he remained outside of the religious communities, even as he seems to have adopted a rather monastic lifestyle, working as a lens maker to earn what was needed to live as he thought and wrote about philosophy until the year of his passing. In this way, it has been said by Yitzhak Malamed of John Hopkins University that Baruch Spinoza was the first European secular Jew. 
Spinoza's approach to philosophy would be profoundly influential in Enlightenment Europe and would become the touchstone for the rise of deism among many of its most important thinkers and doers, including the philosophes of France and more than a few firebrand political thinkers in the New World, most notably Benjamin Franklin and Thomas Jefferson. Later, his work would influence a number of 19th century thinkers such as Karl Marx and Friedrich Nietzsche, whose commitment to materialism was a fundamental part of their work. In the 20th century, however, there was no intellectual so profoundly influenced by Spinoza's ideas as was Albert Einstein, who would say that the Enlightenment philosopher's ideas had had the greatest impact on his own view of the world. As Einstein fled to Europe, growing more hostile to Jews, he would carry with him the ideas of his intellectual and spiritual ancestor to a new land where Spinoza's influence had long been forgotten, but which was more formally enshrined in its founding documents than perhaps in any other place in the world at the time. And while Einstein's part in pushing the United States to become, in the words of Franklin Delano Roosevelt, the arsenal of democracy was a small one, Spinoza's ideas about human freedom would be woven into the constitutions of the liberal governments that would rise from the ashes of fascism at the end of the Second World War. Hello and welcome to the Scientific Odyssey. The Scientific Odyssey is a mini-part journey into the history and philosophy of science. My name is Chad Davies, and I'm the writer, host, and producer of the podcast, where we consider the ideas, processes, and results of over 2,500 years of scientific inquiry and discovery. Series 3, Finding Our Place. Episode 50.11, Supplemental. Albert Einstein, Coming to America. One of the things I found really interesting as I've been doing my research for this uh, not-so-mini series on Einstein is that in almost all of the biographies I've used, which cover most of his life, there is, at around the age of 50, a chapter or a section or a portion that spends a good bit of time talking about his religious and spiritual views in some depth, and then tying them to various philosophical positions he claimed to hold. And there are several reasons for this, I think. First, for many, it is the impending onset of old age that often turns one's mind more seriously to such matters. And while 50 may be the new 40 these days, that certainly wasn't the case in 1929 when Einstein reached that mark and his friends all pooled their resources together to buy him a wonderful sailboat to go with the cottage he was building in Kaputh. In that year, the average male life expectancy was some 58.5 years, a time that would have left the perpetually sort of hypochondriac Einstein less than a decade if it was applied to him specifically. And that tended to focus his mind a bit. Second, in the years between 1925, when strongly probabilistic interpretations of quantum mechanics first appeared, and 1930, when his best argument against Heisenberg and Heisenberg's uncertainty principle was put forward and then defeated at that year's Solvay conference. Einstein was really forced, I think, to sort out how he felt about his philosophical view of the universe, specifically how he saw the role of determinism. This is not to say that he hadn't thought of these issues earlier, quite to the contrary, but rather to recognize that the new quantum mechanics posed a th serious threat to the Laplacian worldview that all motions, and thus all things, that arise from those motions are due only to initial conditions and physical interactions. Third, as Einstein's reputation as an intellectual and social figure grew, there arose a curiosity among many about his views on the various questions that were often discussed in the public square. At this time, as we said in our episodes on Arthur Stanley Eddington, among the more significant topics of discussion had to do with the role of religion in the face of the rising rationalization of life brought about by science and technology. As such, any number of people wanted to know what Einstein's views on religion were, forcing him to spend some time nailing down his views. 
Fourth, and in some ways most consequentially, Einstein found his Jewish identity very much as a result of the persecution that he faced because of it. As he himself noted on many occasions, for most of his later youth and early adult years, he scarcely gave thought to his cultural heritage or his religious views. However, after the end of the Great War and the initial rise of the far-right movement in Germany, he found that the attacks on him, rooted as they were in his Jewishness as much as they were in his ideas, got him to think about what his background meant. Surprisingly, he found in 1920 that he liked the idea of being a Jew, if only a secular one. He found a sense of identity in being a part of a group or movement that formed much of the fabric of his upbringing. While he never went to synagogue or had a bar mitzvah, Judaism was worn, woven into nearly every aspect of his upbringing. Its stories were his stories, even if he did view them as fables. Its colloquialisms were his colloquialisms, even as much as that could be said also for his Germanness. In fact, in light of Jürgen Neffe's quote from last week's episode comparing Germany to a fatal lover Einstein could not do without, one might note that while he would eventually leave Germany never to return, he would carry his Jewish identity with him, suggesting that he helped the Jewish part of his self-identity more deeply than he did his German one. And so, when the latter threatened the former, he found out that he was a Jew. And when the German part of his life really began to threaten the Jewish part of him in 1929 with the rise of Hitler, he seems to have realized that he needed to sort out not just the secular part of things, but also the more spiritual aspects and views that he held. So, what were those views? Well, I think the best place to start would be with working this through by looking at his own words, and then we can kind of proceed from there to fill in the picture a little more completely. So, what was it that he actually did say about his religious or spiritual views? And I'm just going to list off a, a series of quotes here with a little context for each. When he was asked at a dinner party if he was religious, he replied, quote, Yes, you can call it that. Try and penetrate with our limited means the secrets of nature, and you will find that, behind all of the discernible laws and connections, there remains something subtle, intangible, and inexplicable. Veneration for this force, beyond anything that we can comprehend, is my religion. To that extent, I am, in fact, religious." End quote. In his personal credo, something he penned in 1930 while in Kaputh, he wrote, quote, the most beautiful emotion we can experience is the mysterious. It is the fundamental emotion that stands at the cradle of all true art and science. He to whom this emotion is a stranger, who can no longer wonder and stand wrapped in awe, is as good as dead, a snuffed out candle. To sense that behind anything that can be experienced, there is something that our minds cannot grasp, whose beauty and solemnity reaches us only directly, this is religiousness. In this sense, and in this sense only, I am a devoutly religious man." End quote. To a banker in Colorado who made it a habit to write Nobel Prize winners to inquire if they in fact did believe in God, Einstein replied, quote, I cannot conceive of a personal God who would directly influence the actions of individuals or would sit in judgment on creatures of his own creation. My religiosity consists of a humble admiration of the infinitely superior spirit that reveals itself in the little that we can comprehend about the knowable world. That deeply emotional conviction of the presence of a superior reasoning power which is revealed in the incomprehensible universe forms my idea of God." End quote. To a girl from New York who wrote to him from her Sunday school class asking whether he prayed, he sent a surprisingly frank response, indicating that he respected her and her intellect enough not to speak down to her. Quote, Scientific research is based on the idea that everything that takes place is determined by laws of nature, and this holds for the actions of people. For this reason, a scientist will hardly be inclined to believe that events could be influenced by prayer, i.e., by a wish addressed to a supernatural being." End quote. Later in the letter, he continued, quote, "...everyone who is seriously involved in the pursuit of science becomes convinced that a spirit is manifest in the laws of the universe. 
a spirit vastly superior to that of man, and one in the face of which we with our modest powers must feel humble. In this way, the pursuit of science leads to a religious feeling of a special sort, which is indeed quite different from the religiosity of someone more naive." End quote. Next, there is his response to an Orthodox Jewish rabbi, Herbert S. Goldstein, who asked him directly if he believed in God. The context of Goldstein's request is that there had, it had been in response to an article published by the Boston Roman Catholic Cardinal William Henry O'Connell, who had, after reading of Einstein's response, written, I very seriously doubt that Einstein himself really knows what he is driving at, instead claiming that Einstein's ideas represented godlessness. As he wrote about Einstein's theory of relativity and the man who had produced it, O'Connell is said to have written, quote, The outcome of this doubt and befogged speculation about time and space is a cloak beneath which hides the ghastly apparition of atheism, end quote. To this, Goldstein had telegraphed Einstein with a simple question, Do you believe in God? With a prepaid telegraph response not to exceed 50 words. Einstein used exactly half of that amount. Quote, I believe in Spinoza's God, who reveals himself in the lawful harmony of all that exists, but not in a God who concerns himself with the fate and the doings of mankind. End quote. Finally, there is the interview he gave to George Sylvester Varick, a pompous poet who had the knack for, you know, getting interviews with some of the great figures of his day, including men such as Sigmund Freud and even Adolf Hitler. In his interview with Einstein, um, Varick asked a number of penetrating questions that Einstein surprisingly answered really very directly. I'll quote Walter Isaacson's account of the meeting between the two men in Berlin of 1930. Quote, he meaning Varick, was able to secure an appointment to talk to Einstein in his Berlin apartment. There Elsa served raspberry juice and fruit salad. Then the two men went up to Einstein's hermitage study. For reasons not quite clear, Einstein assumed Varick was Jewish. In fact, Varick proudly traced his lineage to the family of the Kaiser, and he would later become a Nazi sympathizer who was jailed in America during World War II for being a German propagandist. Varick began by asking Einstein whether he considered himself a German or a Jew. It is possible to be both, replied Einstein. Nationalism is an infantile disease, the measles of mankind. Should Jews try to assimilate? We Jews have been too eager to sacrifice our idiosyncrasies in order to conform. To what extent are you influenced by Christianity? As a child, I received instruction in both the Bible and in the Talmud. I am a Jew, but I am enthralled by the luminous figure of the Nazarene. You accept the historical existence of Jesus? Unquestionably. No one can read the Gospels without feeling the actual presence of Jesus. His personality pulsates in every word. No myth is filled with such life. Do you believe in God? I am not an atheist. The problem involved is too vast for our limited minds. We are in the position of a little child entering a huge library filled with books in many languages. The child knows someone must have written these books. It does not know how. It does not understand the languages in which they are written. The child dimly suspects a mysterious order in the arrangement of the books, but doesn't know what it is. That, it seems to me, is the attitude of even the most intelligent human being towards God. We see the universe marvelously arranged and obeying certain laws, but only dimly understand these laws. Is this a Jewish concept of God? I am a determinist. I do not believe in free will. Jews believe in free will. They believe that man shapes his own life. I reject that doctrine. In that respect, I am not a Jew. Is this Spinoza's God? I am fascinated by Spinoza's pantheism. But I admire even more his contribution to modern thought because he is the first philosopher to deal with the soul and body as one, and not two separate things. How did he get his ideas? I am enough of an artist to draw freely on my imagination. Imagination is more important than knowledge. Knowledge is limited. Imagination encircles the world. Do you believe in immortality? 
No, and one life is enough for me. End quote. It is here, both in his response to Goldstein and at the end of the interview with Varick, that I think we find the crux of the matter. Einstein, like Spinoza, was a cultural Jew, but he was not a religious one. So what did that mean? Well, let's sort of run down that point by point. Einstein, again, like Spinoza, believed that God and nature were more or less the same thing. In this sense, he was a pantheist. He would, in correspondence, refer to God as, you know, certain different ways, such as God does not play dice, or as God as the Ancient One, or some other personification, but it's clear that this was just a shorthand way of him talking about how the universe itself behaved, and whatever organizing principle it might have. In this way, his idea of God was very similar to that of the Stoics and their idea of Logos. Also, like Spinoza, he was fully deterministic in his position in the free will versus determinism philosophical debate. This is why he was so opposed to the Copenhagen interpretation of quantum mechanics, with its emphasis on probability governing physical processes on the microscopic level. His statement that God did not play dice with the universe or some similar sentiment was really an expression of his rejection of anything other than interactions between particles leading to outcomes, interactions that obeyed ironclad physical laws. For Einstein, free will was a useful illusion, one he suggested was needed to create the conditions for humanity to act morally. As he would write in his 1930 credo, quote, I do not at all believe in free will in the philosophical sense. Everyone acts not only under external compulsion, but also in accordance with inner necessity. Schopenhauer saying, quote, a man can do as he wills, but not will as he wills, end quote, has been a real inspiration to me since my youth. It has been a continual consolation in the face of life's hardships, my own and others, and an unfailing wellspring of tolerance. End quote. As noted in those quotes we read just a bit earlier, Einstein thus rejected the idea of a personal God that might be moved by prayer and petition to intervene in his creation in any way. And as a useful philosophical point, it's not that he didn't as was claimed by some deists, but rather that he or she or it or whatever was actually incapable of intervening. The universe does what the universe does because that's what the interactions between the various pieces and parts of it, from subatomic to cosmological, say it has to do in this point of view, in this philosophical position. Now one of the things I find really laudatory in that this is that unlike many atheists of his time, and to be frank, atheists today, Einstein was never harsh, abusive, or arrogant to those who professed faith in a personal God. Rather, while he was honest, sometimes to the point of frankness about his rejection of their views, he was never derogatory or abusive. In fact, he was often more dismissive of the views of the atheists, not so much of their rejection of the divine, rather than their sense of superiority and attitude of smugness. He would write to one friend regarding atheists, quote, what separates me from most so-called atheists is a feeling of utter humility towards the unattainable secrets of the harmony of the cosmos, end quote. In a separate letter to a U.S. Navy ensign, he would say, quote, You may call me an agnostic, but I do not share the crusading spirit of the professional atheist, whose fervor is mostly due to a painful act of liberation from the fetters of religious indoctrination received in youth. I prefer the attitude of humility corresponding to the weakness of our intellectual understanding of nature and of our own being." End quote. Well, it should be understood, I think, that while Einstein may not have believed in a personal God, he did believe in something bigger than himself. This belief created within him a sense of awe and humility that balanced his tendency towards self-centeredness, especially as he grew older. In this way, he became a kinder version of himself, one that could forgive a great deal and that found great patience in the midst of celebrity where the bright lights and fawning headlines have a way of going to one's head. As he began to contemplate these bigger issues, he began to mature, at least in some ways, into the person we so often think, him of, think of him as being, the wise, old, grandfatherly figure who was kind and funny and never took himself too seriously.
So with the topic of his religious and spiritual views more or less addressed, let's return to our narrative. In our last episode, we left off with Einstein making the decision to accept an offer of a position at the fledgling Institute of Advanced Study in Princeton, New Jersey, and in 1932, sailing for the United States to spend some time at, wait for it, Caltech, not Princeton, once more before returning for a short time to Europe. I'd like to pick up there and actually move backwards a little bit and flesh out those few months a bit more as I think they're illustrative to Einstein's transition and also to make sure that, they're sure that there's no information that I might foster in this series. So let's just recap a bit. In December of 1930, Einstein set out to visit the United States for his second tour, that first one having been back in the early 1920s. He landed in New York, and while he had originally hoped to have, you know, escaped the fanfare that had accompanied his first visit, he eventually agreed to have a press conference with reporters that turned into a bit of a media circus, and there were a whole bunch of things that happened along with that. It was during that first, you know, press conference that he gave the quote about, I, or Hitler, I should say, living on the empty stomachs of his countrymen that suggested that he thought that the leader of the Nazi party was something of a political flash in the pan. After a series of appearances, he departed for California by way to the Panama Canal, and he arrived at Caltech where he spent the first two or so months of 1931 working at the Institute and being shown the work done there, including the Great Hooker Telescope at Mount Wilson that Hubble had used to confirm an expanding universe. In addition to some scientific work, he took in the sights of Hollywood, toured various movie studios, and had a short film made of him and Elsa in a car with a moving and changing background behind them in what was cutting-edge special effects of the time. As part of his Hollywood tour, he expressed admiration for Charlie Chaplin, and so a meeting was set up between the two of them, and they became pretty good friends. Not long after, when the two arrived in black tie attire for the premiere of the movie City Lights, they were wildly applauded, an event that led Chaplin to quip, quote, they cheer me because they all understand me, and they cheer you because no one understands you, end quote. At the end of the stay in Pasadena, Albert and Elsa took a train back to the eastern seaboard of the United States, stopping first at the Grand Canyon and then in Chicago before reaching the Big Apple. It was during this 1930-1931 trip that Einstein spent a lot of time addressing large crowds of pacifists and war resistors and discussing his views of social and economic issues, much to the very conservative Millikan's horror. Millikan was hoping to lure Einstein to Caltech more permanently, but to do so required that he raise a good bit of funding from conservative donors, something Einstein's celebrity and political views might make just a bit more complicated. A year later, in December of 1931, Einstein would again set out for America, but this time his mood was much less optimistic. On the voyage across the Atlantic, he penned the following words in his travel journal. Quote, Today, I am resolved to give up my Berlin position and shall become a bird of passage for the rest of my life. I am learning English, but it doesn't want to stay in my old brain. End quote. It seems that his view of the political situation in Germany had changed significantly in the last year, and he recognized that neither the worldwide economic crisis nor Hitler and the Nazis were going away anytime soon. What seems to have been on his mind was that he and Elsa would become sort of permanent migrants, academic migrants maybe, I don't know quite what to call it. Milliken was working to get the Caltech visiting professorship made permanent so that Einstein would spend two months a year, probably the winter months when Southern California was so preferable, at that institution. Oxford, too, was showing interest in a similar sort of arrangement, as were some universities in Holland, due to Einstein's long friendships, first with Lorenz, and then continuing with Ehrenfest. The question in Einstein's mind was whether he might be able to spend summer and fall back at Kaputh in Germany and not worry about going directly into Berlin and dealing with the political situation there. It was during this second two-month visit that Einstein first met with Abraham Flexner, who had come to Caltech to seek Millikan's advice about how to organize the Institute in Princeton, New Jersey, and then ended up talking for much of the day with Einstein about the project and how the German theoretical physicist might have a role with it. While nothing was decided at the time, it was, you know, 
That's where kind of Einstein became intrigued by the idea and Flexner promised to follow up later in the year when Albert was back in Europe. At the end of this particular trip, what really st stands out is that Einstein was on the horns of a dilemma. Things were deteriorating in Berlin, but he wasn't ready to let go of his peaceful cottage on the lake. He recognized that he didn't have much longer to remain at the heart of German science, especially as Lennart and Stark attacked, you know, their attacks, I should say, on Jewish physics intensified. But he didn't want to abandon Europe altogether. What he seems to have hoped to do is package three or maybe four visiting positions together and rotate between them. And if I may step out of the historical narrative for just a minute, while this may seem like an odd thing to do, it's not all that uncommon for really accomplished scientists, especially those working on the cutting edge of various areas, to do. When I was a grad student, we had a distinguished visiting professor by the name of George Kantopoulos, who had done some really groundbreaking work in astrophysical dynamics and in applications of chaos theory to astrophysical systems. As I may have mentioned in an earlier episode, Kantopoulos is the one guy I've actually known who I think probably deserves a Nobel Prize who doesn't have one. That was kind of the level of his work. Because of that, he actually had three academic positions at three different institutions. One at the place where I was, the University of Florida, one at the Max Planck Institute, and one at his home institution, the University of Thessaloniki. He would move from place to place and act as a sort of human conduit of cutting-edge ideas and research. I can remember each year at Florida, he would come for three or four months, and when he was there, he would hold these three-hour-long sort of research seminars once every week for grad students and research faculty. In the first half of the seminar, for us grad student types, he'd go over all the stuff being taught in special topics seminars all over Europe. And then after an hour and a half of our getting, you know, of us getting our brains absolutely crushed, the research faculty would join us and he'd go on for another 90 minutes about the latest ideas and theories being put forward. Additionally, he'd oversee dissertation work, provide input on research directions, and push the department to higher levels of scholarship. This was the kind of thing that Einstein was trying to set up so he could get out of Germany for much of the year and stay off the radar of his scientific and political enemies from the far right of Germany. When he got back to Germany in the spring of 1932, he found that things were only getting worse. It was really disappointing to him. And so he visited Oxford to get a feel for things there and found the environment to be exceedingly formal and stuffy after his visits to America. In May of 1932, he met with Flexner, and they hammered out an agreement in principle about Einstein joining the new institute. Though, as we'll see, there would be more than a few bumps in the road before everything was kind of finally ironed out. Now, since this will become important down the road in a little bit, let me reiterate that the idea was that Einstein was only going to join the institute on a part-time basis. However, when Millikan found out about the deal, he was pretty furious as he'd hoped to be the one American institution who could claim to have Einstein as visiting faculty. But for Einstein, there was still this idea that he might be able to do both. As such, Einstein agreed to visit Pasadena once more in early 1932 with the possibility of extending his relationship. This, of course, depended on whether the Institute would actually hire him on his terms. And for that point, there are really sort of two sticking points to this. By this time in his career, Einstein had built a small team of people who he trusted to work with. One was his longtime secretary, Helen Dukas, and the other was a relatively good theoretical physicist by the name of Walther Mayer. Mayer had been working with Einstein on grinding out the mathematical details of whatever version of a generalized field theory was being investigated for about five years up to this point, and Einstein wanted him to have sort of a full-time tenured position at the Institute as well. Negotiations around that particular appointment would take a while as Mayer wasn't nearly the academic superstar the Institute was looking for as it offered positions, but Einstein insisted that his team was traveling with him. In the language of big money sports, Einstein was really the big name free agent who wanted roster spots for a few of his trusted role players. The second issue had to do with objections raised by a group of women in the United States known as the Woman Patriot Corporation, a once powerful organization dedicated to protecting America from socialists and pacifists, Marxists and anarchists, feminists and the, the whole like. 
It had been formed following the ratification of the 19th Amendment to the U.S. Constitution that gave women the right to vote, and it had initially enjoyed a good deal of support. However, as time passed and the world in American politics was not wrecked by female voices and votes in the electorate, their influence had waned. However, in 1932, they had just enough juice left to hold up the granting of a visa to Einstein on the grounds that he was somehow going to be subversive and corrupt the youth of America or something like that. In a 16-page memo to the State Department, they wrote asking that it, quote, refuse and withhold such passport visa to Professor Einstein, end quote. They claimed that he was a militant pacifist and a communist who advocated doctrines that would, quote, would allow anarchy to start in unmolested. Not even Stalin himself is affiliated with so many anarcho-communist international groups to promote this preliminary condition of world revolution and ultimate anarchy as Albert Einstein, end quote. Pretty wild stuff and, uh, you know, kind of sounds like the sort of thing you'd hear on, you know, sort of cable news networks, if you know what I mean. And, you know, the thing that's interesting here is, as we said, it's not like the claims were completely spun out of whole cloth, given Einstein's stated support of pacifist groups and his comments on social justice issues. It's just that they took everything he said completely out of context and way too far. This memo, interestingly enough, would be the first document placed in what would become an FBI file that would eventually grow to more than 1,600 pages that, in time, would be used to try and prove that Einstein was a communist, an effort that would, of course, fail at every turn, though not without causing Einstein some problems down the road. And so it was that Einstein was pulled into the U.S. consulate and interrogated by the deputy consul and a fellow officer there. It was really an embarrassing episode that caused Einstein to abruptly conclude the interview and walk out, thus threatening the entire set of arrangements. The next day, the New York Times, which had been following the entire proposal to get Einstein to come to the United States permanently, reported on the turn of events, and within 24 hours, the whole situation got resolved. It really was a great example of negotiating in the press as Elsa told the Times reporter that her husband had quit packing, an announcement that sparked the scramble to fix the damage that had been done. When things were smoothed over, the Times headline was, Einstein resumes packing. And so it was that in December of 1932, Einstein left to travel to Caltech while he waited for the facilities that would house the Institute to get completed, something that would still take a bit of time. Not long after he left, things really took a turn for the worse in Germany, something he seems to have seen coming as he packed in an inordinately large number of bags, some 30 in total, bat between, you know, suitcases and trunks, to travel with. Not the thing a guy who plans to only stay a couple of months does. While it's clear that he seems to have held out hope for being able to return to Kaputh at some later date, continuing events in Germany would soon completely rule that out. It would be during this trip that Einstein would begin to warn others of Hitler's rise to power, something confirmed on January 30, 1933, when Hitler was elected Chancellor of Germany. Still, Einstein hoped to return home, and so in February he wrote friends about how, you know, they could calculate his salary on his return to Berlin in April. By the end of that month, however, the Reichstag was in flames, and brown shirts were looting the homes of Jews, both in Berlin and across the country. Shortly thereafter, he would write one of the women with whom he was conducting an affair, quote, Because of Hitler, I don't step, dare step on German soil, end quote. On the day before he left Pasadena, he gave an interview to a reporter with the New York World Tribute, one Evelyn Seeley, in which he said, quote, As long as I have any choice in the matter, I shall live only in a country where civil liberty, tolerance, and equality of all citizens before the law prevail. These conditions do not exist in Germany at the present time, end quote. It was pretty clear that he wouldn't be returning to his cottage on the lake, anytime soon. And in a coincidence, brought with symbolism, as the reporter was taking leave of Einstein, 
Los Angeles, not far from Pasadena, was struck by a devastating earthquake that killed 116 people, and that allowed Seeley to conclude her article, quote, as he left for the seminar, walking across the campus, Dr. Einstein felt the ground shaking under his feet, End quote. At nearly that exact same time, Einstein's stepdaughter Margot was cowering in the apartment that he and Elsa shared in Berlin as it was raided twice by members of the Nazi party looking for subversive or treasonous material. As a result, she and her husband worked to get all, all of Einstein's papers out of Berlin through the French embassy there, something they would repeat again with his work kept at the cabin in Kaputh. For his part, Einstein had a lot of time to think on the train ride from Pasadena back east, and so it was that when he stopped off in Chicago to address pacifists there, he began to moderate his message, much to their chagrin. He was modifying his theories to fit new data, something scientists often do, and that data suggested that Hitler and the Nazis were a new thing entirely, and that the world may have to rearm itself to bring Germany into line with international accords. It was a message many years ahead of its time, and it would be ignored for far too long. On the ocean voyage back to Europe, Einstein had to figure out where he would now live. As his friend Paul Schwartz, the German consul in New York, had told him, quote, they'll drag you through the streets by the hair, end quote, if he went back to Berlin. Fortunately, of course, his ship docked in Berlin, and the government there was willing to offer him asylum. And so it was that on March 28th, after the ship landed in Antwerp, he was driven to the German consulate in Brussels, and for the second time in his life, he turned in his passport and renounced his German citizenship. He also resigned from the Prussian Academy. These two reactions, as we talked about in the last episode, produced a strong reaction back in Germany, and he was roundly condemned as being a traitor to the country. Several pamphlets appeared that, in essence, called for his assassination, and there was a strong rumor of there being a $5,000 bounty on his head. This was alongside the increasingly draconian measures passed by the Nazi government against Jews that we've discussed in other episodes. As a result, the Belgian government tried to hide him in his small group away so that he couldn't be found by the possible Nazi, Nazi assassins, though those efforts were, by and large, ineffective. Fortunately, the Nazis were far more engaged in establishing their power in the German homeland than they were in hunting down dissidents in neighboring countries. On the academic front, as news of Einstein's defection and resignation spread across Europe, offers began to pour in from the various universities, thus bringing the issue of where he would land once again to the forefront. While nothing would eventually come of any of these, they did allow Einstein to negotiate a deal with Flexner that gave Mayer a position at the Institute. Not long after this, Einstein was convinced to relocate to Britain for a time, before, but before he did that, he had one other thing to attend to. The previous fall, not long before he left Berlin for his third trip to the United States, he had received a letter from his old friend Michele Besso. Besso was still living in Zurich and had written a long and intensely personal communication to Albert, urging him to try one more time to spend time with his youngest son, Edward. While he had not been able to take him to America again, Albert now took time to travel to Switzerland to see Maleva and to try to connect with his deeply troubled youngest son. While things between he and his first life were amiable enough, amiable enough actually for Albert to stay with her, the visit with Edward was fraught and difficult. They were unable to find common ground in any way except through music, Einstein on the violin and Edward on the piano, most often playing Mozart together in the visiting room of the asylum Edward had been committed to. When he left, it was the last time Einstein would see his youngest son or his first wife. While he had assumed he would return to Europe to see them again, the events of the next decade plus made that impossible. After the visit to Zurich, he traveled back and forth from Belgium to England for a variety of reasons, including lecturing and work at Oxford. While at Oxford, he stayed with, for a time, a British commander by the name of Oliver Locker Lamson, someone who can probably best be described as a man of daring and adventure. If you want to know more about this guy, you should go look him up. His, his story is really amazing. 
The two had met through an unlikely correspondence, and so when Einstein traveled to England, the two looked each other up and soon an invitation was extended. While Einstein was in England, Locker Lamson introduced him to Winston Churchill, at the time in his wilderness period as a member of the opposition party in Parliament, as well as Austin Chamberlain. Both men agreed with Einstein's assessment that Hitler was very likely an existential threat to Europe and England would be wise to begin rearmament. As the time for Einstein to depart America approached, he was once again marked for assassination by some in Germany, so he was secreted away in a secluded country cottage of Lockyer Lamson's in an almost 007-esque arrangement with two female British Secret Service agents assigned to guard him. As was the case in Belgium, the whole thing seemed to be more for show than out of real concern, as pictures of Einstein posing in hunting gear with his bodyguards were circulated in the British press, and it was pretty easy for anyone who was looking for him to find him. In October of 1933, Einstein departed England to travel to the United States for what would be the last time. Upon reaching New York Harbor, he was transferred by Flexner's order to a tugboat and taken to New Jersey so as to avoid the press. And so it began a somewhat difficult relationship between the two men, as Flexner would try to limit and control Einstein's access to public media in general, while Einstein would chafe under these restrictions. Flexner was concerned that Einstein's political activism and support of Zionist causes would lead to flare-ups of anti-Semitism in the United States. Flexner, himself of Jewish ancestry, had, much like Haber in many ways, decided that the best path for Jews in America was to assimilate as much as possible so as not to engender any hostility. Einstein, on the other hand, had seen how that had gone in Germany and didn't much buy the argument. Moreover, from his perspective, he didn't see that there was much anti-Semitism in the United States compared to what he had encountered in Europe. This divergence of views would lead the two to clash early on after Einstein discovered that Flexner had been intercepting his mail and keeping him from responding to various invitations, including one from the American White House. This set up a showdown that Einstein would win, but that would cost him Flexner's support for, his remain for the remainder of his time at the Institute. On the domestic side of things, Albert and Elsa settled pretty quickly into life in Princeton, a life that they enjoyed very much. It is from this time that stories of Einstein playing his violin for trick-or-treaters and Christmas carolers became somewhat common. Before long, Einstein adopted the persona most are familiar with today, the kind, gentle, brilliant, but often absent-minded professor who occasionally got lost walking the streets of Penston and thought. Part of this was accidental, but it should be said, part of it was intentional, as it allowed Einstein to join the community in such a way that his celebrity never really became much of an issue. As he would jokingly say, quote, I'm kind of an ancient figure, known primarily for his non-use of socks and wheeled out on special occasions as a curiosity, end quote. His disheveled appearance was, to a degree, an act of rebellion, one of the few he still outwardly engaged in. As he told one of his neighbors, quote, I've reached an age when, if someone tells me to wear socks, I don't have to." End quote. So it was that in April of 1934, with the issue between he and Flexner at least partly resolved, and him and Elsa having settled in Princeton, he announced that he had decided to remain at the Institute full-time, foregoing any traveling to visit other universities in Europe or the United States. In time, he would be joined by his sister, a stepdaughter, and his oldest son, Albert all of whom would flee the growing shadow in Europe. Unfortunately, Elsa's oldest daughter, Ilsa, would not survive to join them, as in 1934 she was felled by leukemia. Elsa traveled back to France to be with her daughter at the end and brought back her ashes to the United States. She also arranged for her husband's notes and scientific papers to be forwarded to him from the French embassy. Shortly after she and the ashes left France, the Night of the Long Knives took place in Germany, bringing the more extreme and ideological wing of the Nazi party into full control of Germany. It was this act of barbarity that finally severed all ties the Einsteins had to their homeland. Einstein would never return to his cottage on the lake, nor walk the halls of the one day to be renamed to Max Planck Institute, where he had once delivered the lectures that had revealed his full theory of relativity. He was, once again, 
A Man Without a Country. As we wrap up this episode, there are a couple of things I'd like to do. First, I want to welcome those of you who have joined the crew of the Odyssey here recently. It's great to have you aboard, and I hope you're enjoying the journey. Please feel free to share the podcast with your friends and to reach out and say hi, either through our Facebook group, on Twitter, where I go by the handle at Chad Davies, or by emailing me at cldavies at mac.com. Several of you have already reached out to me there, and I've really enjoyed hearing from you. Also, remember, this is our Summer of Odyssey, so send us pictures of your holiday travels and scientific sites, and we'll share them with the rest of the crew. I really do love hearing from you all and seeing what you're doing. And in that vein, this week's shout-out goes to the crew members, Micah and Dale, who've been making astronomical observations and sketches using a 12 and a half inch um, reflecting telescope. You can see a picture of them on our Facebook page, um, something that they were kind enough to send me so that I could post there. Next week, we'll look at Einstein's life and work at the Institute of Advanced Study and consider the letter that began what would become the Manhattan Project. Until then, full sails on your journey.